Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Aftadu salati wa tamu tasneem. Ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabatihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillah. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah today we're going to be discussing a very important topic and that is the building blocks of righteous youth. And um, my name is Hamza Abdul Malik. I am the Imam of Midtown Mosque in Memphis, Tennessee. And I run a school, a uh, leadership academy, Quran and Leadership Academy called Miraj Academy. Uh, and many students from the Bay Area uh, originally were part of our first cohort. We actually take students from all over the country and we bring them to Memphis, Tennessee. We teach them leadership skills, we teach them Quran, um, and we give them other skill sets, which inshallah, if we have time, we'll talk about that. And we send them back to their communities so that they can become future influencers in the religious sense uh, in their communities and begin to, you know, the building blocks of leadership. Um, which is what this topic is about. Um, the principles of how to develop into a righteous person um, is usually found at a young age. So the age that you are, uh, I'm assuming like the average age, we're talking from what, 14 to 7, 18? Am I right there? All right, so high school age. Um, some of you might be a little younger, some of you might be a little older, and we have some adults here as well. Um, <clears throat> the building brought, you're literally in the age right now. It doesn't seem like that right now. But right now, what you learn right now is going to affect you for the rest of your life. You, you talk about traumatic experiences, for example. A person goes through a traumatic experience, they have to deal with that traumatic experience for the rest of their lives, right? So it might have been a year or two where you just had a really bad year at this age range, but it becomes a bad life <laughs> down the road where, you know, because the residual effects of the experiences you had at this age have become foundational to who you are. So it's very important that you protect your heart. It's very important that you protect your mind, um, and your soul, um, not just to protect it in a protect in a, a preserving sense, but to build and develop it. Because just as you have a traumatic experience, for example, and that affects you negatively, you can have a transformative experience, and that affects you positively for, for the rest of your life. All right? And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, throughout the Quran, He gives us examples of people who are around your age. Um, and we've all been that age at one point in time, um, who are examples of that in positive and negative ways. And so um, Brother uh, Mu'min was telling me about what the, the, you were talking about, the story of Yusuf, alayhi salam. They were all, that, that story, think about that. Allah is talking about a family of boys who are your age. He mentions them in the Quran. He gives you their whole life story. What happens the things that they do at that age defined everything that happened after that. Yusuf is in his 40s and they're still dealing with what happened when he was a child. Right? Um, I don't know how far along you got into the story. So and this isn't the lesson for today. Um, but that's an example. And like, it's so important that Allah dedicated an entire surah to talk about that. Not only, and this is just a little nugget of wisdom about Surah Yusuf. Surah Yusuf is about Yusuf, obviously. It's about his brothers, but it's also an origin story for a group of people. Do we know who those people are. You're all familiar with origin stories, right? The idea of an origin story. Right? It's an origin story for an entire nation of people. Who are those people? The prophets? 
right? Well, that, those, are, those are the ancestors of Yaqub and his, and his sons. But we're talking about the descendants of those people are who? Bani Israel. Bani the story of Yusuf, alayhi salam, and his brothers and the relationship that he had with his brothers and the struggles that he went through with, with his brothers is the origin story of the children of Israel. Everything that happens after that is a direct result of that story. In fact, Yahud, the, the Jews are called Yahud. They attribute that, that name, Yahud, one of the ways that they interpret it is that it goes back to one of the brothers, Judah, right? Um, uh, and so they actually named themselves later on down the road, you know, centuries, thousands of years later, they start naming themselves after one of the, their ancestors, right? So the point is, why do I say all of that? Because you might think that you're just living your own teenage life and having your own teenage problems, just like they, they thought they were just fooling around. Um, but that has consequences for other people in your lifetime that they will have to deal with for the rest of their lives. But not only that, it might affect your entire lineage and how your lineage looks back. You're someone's ancestor. You're potentially going to be someone's ancestor. You're potentially going to be someone's great grandparent. And so your life, and they're going to talk about how you lived your life and what you did, what you accomplished, for better and for worse, positive and negative. And obviously Allah also mentions it. So there's no point in life where it's, it's, it's a throwaway year. Right? Everything matters. Everything makes a difference. Everything has a value. And the question is, how do I tap into that value? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Right? The building box of... Righteous use. With, with the lessons are going to be from the people of the cave. Surah al Kaf. How many of you have read Surah al Kaf? If you haven't, that's fine. Right? Surah al Kaf is a surah that covers a number of stories. The very first story is the story of the people of the cave. Before he goes into that story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a very important point. Before we get to that point, I want to ask you a question. We're going to, you know, engage in this together. The reason why is because there's a hadith where the Prophet says, Anytime a group of people get together, so we're a group of people and we've gotten together. In one of the houses of Allah. So where are we at? House of Allah. So we're a group of people, we've gathered together in the house of Allah, yet Luna Kitab Allah, reciting the book of Allah, which we will be engaged in with the book of Allah. بينهم, and they mutually study it with one another. What I, what I mean by mutually studying is that I'm not the only one speaking. I'm, for example, we're talking about an issue. We're learning from each other. We're coming up with ideas. We're drawing out wisdom from each other. What happens when those people get together and do that in the house of Allah? The Prophet Sallallahu says, إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّكِينَةِ Anytime that happens, Allah will bring down tranquility among those people. Right? He actually relieves, it's a stress reliever. It's an anxiety reliever. It re alleviates depression. It has mental health benefits and spiritual health for sure, right? Nezalat alayhim sakina. Allah will bring down sakina, which is tranquility and peace on them. Ghashiyat humur rahma. Then he will cover them and surround them. He would like basically cover them with mercy. So you become more compassionate. You become more empathetic. You become more emotionally intelligent. As a result, you become more merciful with each other. This is how we build those bonds with each other by having these kind of positive experiences with the Quran together as a community. And then the angels surround the gathering. There are angels that go all over the world 
flying all over the world looking for their sustenance. Like we eat food, right? We drink water or what have you. The angels, they don't eat and drink. But what they do, they do dhikr. And they're, sustain, and they're uh, motivated by dhikr. They're energized by remembrance of Allah. And so they look for places like this to come and congregate and they surround us and they continue to surround you up until, like they pile on up until they reach the heavens. Well, uh, and Allah will talk about you to those who are with him. Just like he speaks about the people of the cave. These are people who were like that. So Allah speaks about them to other people. We know about these people because Allah speaks about them. And there are people who are going to know about you because Allah spoke about you. Allah, Allah is saying this, or the Prophet is saying this. Uh, so I say all of that because in order to qualify for those benefits, peace, tranquility, mercy, angels surrounding us, making dua for us, and Allah talking about us to his prophets and to his angels. We have to gather together. We've already done that. We're in a masjid. We're already in one of the houses of Allah. And now we are also going to engage with Quran and mutually discuss things with one another. So one of the things we want to discuss, why did Allah make this world so enjoyable? There's no right or, you know, I mean, there is a right, there are right and wrong answers, but that's not, this isn't a test, this is an exam, no one's getting judged or graded based on this. We want to just stimulate thought. Why do you think Allah made the world an enjoyable place to live? What's your name? Arham. Arham? MashaAllah. Okay, enjoy the place and respect the environment. Anything else? What's your name? Zainab? Okay, so the world, so he made the world a little bit distracting to see how much we love him. Okay. So the more beautiful it is, the more enjoyable it is, the more distracting it is. And the more distracting it is, the more proof that we can show that we love Allah because we're willing to leave those distractions and worship Allah. That's an interesting take. Anyone else? Yes. What's your name? Hannah. Hannah? Okay. As a mercy. So Allah's just being merciful with us. So he just made the world an easy place to live in. One more person. Well, one of you going to raise your hand? You were going to, yeah, go ahead. To test us. All of those answers are not wrong. But in this particular case, there is an answer that Allah actually gave in this surah, right? Anyone memorized Surah Kaf? I saw you nod your head. <laughs> I saw you nod your head. What's your name? What's your name? Nisa? Anisa, mashallah. Anisa, mashallah. Um, so you can correct me if I'm wrong when I recite this. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ja'alna ma'ala al-ardi zinatan laha. He says, and we've decked the earth with all kinds of ornaments. All kinds of beautiful things. Why? What's your name again? Abia. Abia. To test the people. Right? And that goes into other things that you've said. Respecting the environment is a test to see if you're going to respect it. Right? Sometimes, sometimes Allah gives us things that we enjoy, that we like, to see how we're going to use it. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. In the Quran, Allah talks about Musa alayhi salam is well known, and if you don't know, you feel free to ask about something that you don't know about. You know, I, I don't know what you know and what you don't know. So I might say something that you don't know anything about and move on, 
but I don't want you to just not know what I'm talking about. So feel free to raise your hand, be like, what, is, what does that mean? What's that about? And I can explain it, no problem. So Musa alayhi salam was in his people, the children of Israel, were being persecuted by the Pharaoh. Allah sent Musa to save them from the Pharaoh. While he was trying to convince the Pharaoh, Musa alayhi salam was, at first he was, came to convince him to release the children of Israel. Right? Do it voluntarily. Do it willingly. If you, if you can, worship Allah. That would be the ideal thing. Become a Muslim. But if not, at least release the children of Israel. The Pharaoh became worse. And he tortured the children of Israel, and you know, basically he became you know, a, a, a worse tyrant. So the children of Israel went to Musa salam, and they said, min qabli an ta'tiyana. We were suffering before you came, wa min ba'di ma jitana. and we're still suffering after you came. Like in other words, they, couldn't, they didn't appreciate Musa salam, coming like, basically you're, do, you're doing nothing, you're not helping the situation, you're only making it worse for us. So Musa salam, he responded, he said, Asa Rabbukum aduwakum. It might be that Allah will destroy your enemy. Right? You want you want the Pharaoh to go away. You want Allah to destroy the, the Pharaoh so you can live a good life. Okay. The Allah might destroy your enemy. And then he will make you the inheritors of the earth. He'll give you power. He'll put you in positions of authority. So he will see how you will behave. Right? Yes, you're complaining about the Pharaoh. But what happens when the Pharaoh's removed and he puts you in that position? How are you going to behave? We see how, how they're behaving. Right? They're behaving just like the Pharaoh. Right? Actually, worse. The Pharaoh let women live, right? So the, 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 these people who claim to be children of Israel or the descendants of the children of Israel are acting worse than, 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 than the Pharaoh. In any case, the point is, it's a test. So you can complain about how other people are behaving, which is fine. And then if someone's behaving wrong, that's fine. But when Allah puts you in position to have these things, to have authority, to give you freedom, to do things, to make choices. What kind of choices are you going to make? He's going to test the people to see which one of them does the best deeds, not just good deeds. Allah wants to put us in this position to see who's going to be the best. This is a competition. A competition where the loser wins as well. Some, you know, not everyone who loses is a loser, right? So you have people who are in Firdos, the highest level of paradise. You have people who are in other levels of paradise under that. So for example, let's say we were all memorizing Quran. You know, one person finishes Quran and does several different recitations, Qira'at, so on and so forth. On the day of judgment, Allah is going to say, recite. Recite the Quran like you used to recite in the world. And you will, for every ayah that you recite, you will go up a higher degree in paradise. Every single ayah. All right, so Fatiha. Seven, eight ayat. That's seven, eight degrees in paradise just for Noah Fatiha. Right? All right. Surah Baqarah, you know, 200 something, so on and so forth. You just keep going and going until you reach the end and now you're at the highest level of paradise. Right? Those of us who didn't do as well might know half the Quran. That's not being, a, you're not a loser, so to speak. You just didn't get what the other person got. All right? So, but we're supposed to compete with one another, motivate each other support each other, strengthen each other, so that we can do our best. We want to bring the best out of each other. That's what Allah wants us to do, right? Um, so this life is a test. Unfortunately for you, it's the hardest due to the age that you're in. Why? It's not your fault. That's just the way life works, right? You have the most energy, strongest desire, biologically speaking, 
It's just a scientific fact. But you also lack wisdom and knowledge because you haven't lived long enough. Right? A person that is, so let's say you're 15 years old. Would anyone argue that a 15-year-old has more wisdom or more, let's say, more experience than a five-year-old? Right? Is, is, that, is that for debate? No. The same applies as you get older. Right? Now, as you get older, the, the, the older you get, the less you think other people have more, <laughs> more experience than you. But the same thing applies. You might be 15 years, years old now, but a 25-year-old has more experience. A 35-year-old has more experience than that. A 45. This is why your elders are so important. The Prophet Sallallahu said, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ لَمْ يَرْحَمْ صَغِيرَنَا this is why the Prophet Sallallahu says, you are not from, uh, from us. The, a, a person will not be considered from my people, meaning the Prophet Sallallahu people. If they don't have mercy with the young and respect for the old. Why mercy for the young and respect for the old as opposed to respect for the young and mercy for the old? Mercy for the young because the young don't know what they're doing. So you have to be merciful. You have to be you know, gentle, merciful, try to you know, help them along. Respect and honoring the elders because of the wisdom they have. Respect that, that wisdom. Doesn't mean everything they're saying is right, but it's something to learn from. Right? They say that the, the, the older you are, the closer you are to the unseen realm. The unseen realm, but I didn't live in 1960. I don't know what happened in 1960. That's the unseen realm for me. I'll never know. I wasn't there, but somebody might have lived at that time who could tell me something about it, right? Uh, I don't know what it's like to live 20 years on this earth, for example, and, and like as an adult, not as a child, like and, and understand how things begin and end, the life cycle of something, right? To see a country begin and end, to change from one country and turn into a whole nother country, like literally a new name, new politics, Knew everything. A whole war begin and end. Never seen that. So it's all theory when you're young. But when you're older, you have experience. So it's difficult the younger you are because desire is strongest, wisdom and experience is at its lowest. As you get older, it starts switching. By the time you get to 40, Shabab is considered, like youth, is considered from puberty to about 40 years old. So up until you're 40, you're still a newbie at this. You get better at being new at it, but you at, why 40? Because you've seen everything take its full cycle. You've seen enough people die in your lifetime, right? You, like person, people you know, friends, family. You've seen death. You've seen life. You haven't seen, like, so you've seen a, a person go from infancy to 20 years old, to go from literally being born to being an adult. You've experienced someone else doing that, right? Not just yourself, you've been able to see it from, as a, as a spectator, to see the whole life cycle and how this affected them at two years old. That wind up making them like this at four years old, which made them like that at 12, which made them like that at 18, and now they're 20 years old in jail, or now they're 20 years old and they're married and doing well, or, or what have you, right? You've been able to see that from experience, right? So up to 40, then 40 upward, now you're grown, right? You, you, you have a lot of wisdom. But the problem is when you reach 40, your energy goes down. <laughs> your energy goes down. You literally, your body starts literally breaking down, right? It's harder to get out of bed, right? <laughs> you, you, also have, you also have memories. I remember we talked about trauma. You're having good experience and bad experiences. You had a lot of bad experiences. So you now you, you got that going on in your mind as well. You're trying to wrestle with mistakes that you made. You haven't made that many mistakes yet because you're young. As you make mistakes, you got to live with those mistakes. Right? So your energy goes down. It's harder. So, you know, a lot creates a balance for everything. You have more energy, less knowledge, less wisdom. The older you get, less energy, more knowledge, more wisdom. That's why we need each other. Right, that's why you need youth involved in community and you need elders involved in community and you take advantage of the strengths that each of them have.
But this is also why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the greatest rewards for those, for those young people who dedicate, who uh, prove their love and sincerity to Allah, as you mentioned. Right? They prove that because they gave up without all that experience. See, a, a person who's like 40 or 60, they already learned the hard way. So when, it, when, when they have another chance of doing something, you know, I've already learned how to do it wrong, so I'll just do it right this time. Whereas when you're younger, and you make good decisions based on just trusting Allah and His Messenger, right? That's more sincere. You're not doing it because you had a bad experience. You're doing it just purely because you believe in what Allah's saying. That's real. That's a lot more sincere than someone who's doing it because they just don't want to fall into the same thing they were in before. You see what I'm saying? Maybe they don't need to believe in a lot in order to have that logic. Does that make sense? All right? But when you're younger and you do it simply because you love Allah and His Messenger, Allah gives you more reward. You've, and that's why one of the people who are in the shade on the Day of Judgment, on the day there's no shade except Allah's shade, what that shade, that shade is extremely important on Day of Judgment. You know, the sun is going to be extremely co close. The physics, the science on the Day of Judgment doesn't work like science now, like gravity and, and heat. Like, for example, in, 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 in Hellfire, the Prophet وسلم, says that Hellfire, compared to fire in this world, if you, if you, have ex, if you had experienced Hellfire and then you were in then you saw like a campfire or bonfire, you can sleep on it, right? It's almost like uh, the weather, right? When you, when, if you live in a climate where it's always like 100 degrees, and you've adapted to it, when it's like 70, it's like cold. It's, it's like you feel really cold. I used to live in South Dakota, and South Dakota has sub-zero weather in the winter, meaning below zero. So they'd be like highs in uh, the negative 20s. Right. That's the, high, the highest it's going to get today is in the negative 20s, right? below zero. And it will be like that all winter long. So then when the spring comes and it's like 20 degrees outside, literally people are taking off their jackets, they're going jogging, they got shorts on. 20 degrees, right? <laughs> That's, it's all relative. How you feel about things is all relative to what you've experienced. Hellfire is so hot that this world's fire, you could sleep on compared to that. Like, you, you'd, you'd be very comfortable. You can go to, you can fall asleep in it. That's how good it is. On the day of judgment, now I say all of that because even then, you're, when a person's in hellfire, there's no such thing as death. Death is for this world. That's a scientific thing that Allah created for this world. The next world has different rules. There's no death. Um, like, for example, you think about how bad do you have to be injured in order to die? No, no, that's a, that's a regular, rather, that's a, that's a rhetorical question, right? So, because some people literally have fallen out of planes, hit the ground, and survived. Fallen out of 10-story buildings, not everybody, obviously most people die from these things. But, science, but, you know, there are exceptions to those rules. So, and some people, you know, they might get a small cut, infect, infection, and die, or a toothache. Because they infect, infected the blood, and they just die. It was not like a major gunshot wound, these type of things. No, no. So, but death is a reality in this world. In the next world, it doesn't matter how bad a person's body is injured. Death is just not part of the equation in hellfire or in paradise. So a person's, uh, you know, you know, the lightest punishment in hellfire is like, OK, in all of hellfire, the easiest punishment, like the least punishment is what? Anybody know? Anybody heard of what the least punishment is in hellfire? What's your name? Boiling water, not exactly. No, what is your name? Mahriz. Boiling water, 
Almost, but not exactly. Anyone else want to give a stab at it? You know something about it? First time hearing this? Least punishment in hellfire? First time? The Prophet ﷺ says that a sandal, there's two, two narrations on this, a sandal will be carved out of hellfire. Right? So from the fire, it's going to be like a, a, a shoe that's made. Another narration is coals, a couple coals that they take. And this is where you were almost right, right? Because it's on the feet, right? So they, they put them on the person's feet. So they put these shoes on, these sandals on, made out of hellfire. And, uh, or, the, you know, or the rocks of hellfire. They stand on them. And just by doing that, the person's brains boil. You know, your brain is like in liquid. In the, it's like floating in, in liquid. Um, so the closest, thing to, the closest thing to that, like I said, you know, it's the, it, hellfire is nothing compared to this world, right? But the closest thing you can think about in terms of that type of heat is a microwave, right? So because the, 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 it's on your feet, but the brains are boiling, you know, it's like, it's like putting something in a microwave and it just go, the, the, the heat, the radiation goes inside and begins to liquefy things or heat up things from the inside. That's the least, it, in other words, it gets no easier than that. That's about as easy as it's going to get in Hellfire. It only gets worse, right? Uh, we can do a whole class just on that. Um, the point is, no matter how bad, like let's say, let's say the, wor the least punishment hellfire person's brain's boiling, they never die. It's just perpetual pain and suffering. Person's skin burns off, it just regenerates to burn again, so on and so forth. So you want to do whatever you can to avoid that on the day of judgment. The heat, so just because the sun is close, you would think, oh, we're just disintegrate. We'll just burn up and die. Now on the day of judgment, you just suffer from the heat. That is how, that in the beginning, before anyone is, is, is questioned, before the scales come, before people go into paradise or hell, people just stand for 50,000 years under the sun, which is either this close or a mile up. Just one mile. And people are just baking, roasting under the sun. So much so that people are, you know, they're sweat. So you would think the sweat would evaporate, right? Because it's so hot. Not, that's the physics of this world. The water, you know, the person like literally boils in their own sweat. All right, so the sweat comes down to their ankle. Some of them sweat. And this is all part of the amount of punishment that each person deserves based on what they did in this world. Down to their ankles, some people it comes up to their knees, some people it comes up to their hips, some people it comes up to their chest, some people they're like on their toes and they're trying to stay above water. If you've ever been in the swimming pool, that type of thing, if you can't swim, you know, you just be sitting there trying to stay above. And some people are just perpetually drowning without dying in their own sweat. Well, you know who's not there? A youth who grew up worshiping Allah. <laughs> Where are they? They are under the shade of Allah's throne. Literally chilling. Just relaxing, chilling, drinking, cool aid. <laughs> uh, yeah, not, not Kool Aid, you know, but cool drink, right? Drinking cool drinks. Enjoying life for 50,000 years. I mean, there's other things that are happening under the throne we don't know about, right? All we know is that we're not over under the, under the sun. That is what, why? what? Why does Allah do, do that for youth? There are other people who will be under the shade beyond the youth who did that. Why that particular reward? No ideas? I have a theory.
They left the sun, the burning desire in this world. Burning desire, because this is literally a burning desire. Like inside you, you want to do things. You got energy. You want to you want to do it your way. But you gave that up to be under the shade and protection of Allah's law and the Sunnah of the Prophet. You gave that up already. So now when everybody's burning, so the people who decided not to do that, I'm gonna do whatever I want, I'm going to just obey my desires, those people will burn under the sun. But the people who gave that up now get to get the rewards of giving up that by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala putting them under the shade. So not only is it so important that Allah gives these benefits, that's just one benefit. There are others that come after that. But Allah talks about people in the Quran. The story of the people of the cave. How much time do I have? I don't have a clock. So we have seven minutes? Wow, okay. I got ahead of myself. All right. When do you when do you want to stop? Um, just two minutes ahead of as we jog on, right? Okay. About five minutes and then we then we yeah. take a break. Okay. All right, so uh, we'll talk about this and then we'll we'll take our break, right? So we want to talk to build talk about the building blocks. Okay, how do I become one of these people? Right? And as a parent, how do I develop, you know, my children to be like these people? who are getting these benefits. We look at the story of the people of the cave in the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf. Allah tells us, um, We relate to you, O Prophet, their story, the story of the people of the cave. In truth, like this is a real story. This isn't, this isn't some fairy tale. Like this really happened to real people, right? This is truth. Innahum fitya, they were youth. Amanu birabbihim, they truly believed in their Lord, was it nahum huda, and we increased them in guidance. So the first pillar to attaining this level is belief and guidance. Belief is about faith, guidance is about knowledge. How do you incorporate this? Now, you know, you'll see pictures, obviously these aren't the people of the cave. <laughs> these are actually my Mirage students in, in, in Memphis. Um, I just figured it'd be a nice thing to add to it. Uh, okay, so how do you in in inculcate this pillar? There's many different ways you can do that. Um, the general principle though is prioritize faith building experiences. Like when you're doing events, don't think about like, how much information you're gonna learn. The question, how do you, how do you measure how, how valuable an event is going to be? You should measure it based on whether or not it's increasing your faith or not. If by the end of it, and you should do surveys and things like that to just ask, did this event increase your faith? What exactly was it about that event that increased your faith? Right? Like even with this, even what, you know, even with this, what we're doing now, like in the end of this, maybe, you know, ask the students, get feedback, which aspects increase your faith, which aspects, you know, might have been interesting, but it didn't necessarily increase my faith. You identify those things, so we're going to do that more. The other things, you know, might be for some other purposes, but this we do more, right? And knowledge, more than technical and scientific knowledge. Technical and scientific knowledge is also essential because you have to know the difference between right and wrong, but in order to have the motivation to do that, you have to have faith first, right? Um, so you can do retreats, create environments, you know, go, go on retreats, focus on the law. Uh, now, what information do we teach to, to develop faith? Things like stories of the prophets, like, like you, you know, story, uh, Surah Yusuf, Sirah, um, signs of the Day of Judgment, right? We're talking about Day of Judgment, it's not the signs, but we're talking about the Day of Judgment, events on the Day of Judgment, details of heaven and hell, signs of Allah in nature. We didn't get into that, but signs of Allah in nature, right? These are things that build your faith. Do you feel like your faith was built a little bit by learning about, you know, what happens in hell? Right? These are things that build faith. So if we're focused on, and we'll, and we'll, and we'll stop here.
Um, we, if we have time later on, I'll unpack this hadith in more detail. But the idea is Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, while I was a young girl of playing age, in other words, this is back in the Meccan period, right? Before she moved in with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So this is early on in the Meccan period. What were the Muslims learning in the Meccan period? The following verse was revealed in Mecca to Muhammad, nay, but the hour is their appointed time and the hour will be more grievous and more bitter. In other words, these are the things that the Sahaba were learning. It was more so about not you know, what time prayer is and things like that, but more so what is going on in the day of judgment? Why should, you know, inculcating fear of Allah's punishment and love and desire for Allah's reward. These are the ayat that Allah revealed to the Prophet wasallam in the beginning to cultivate that faith. So then later on, uh, you know, the halal and haram, do not drink, do not fornicate, these type of things. Those were revealed later on. Because you need to have, you need to be motivated to want to do good before being told what to do. Right? So, um, and I'm, you know, I'm summarizing this. Obviously, you can see it's much longer. Um, but you need to learn these things. And these are the things that will develop that first pillar, inshallah. Speaking of pillars, we have the second pillar of Islam that we have to fulfill. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, how much time do we have? So I, at this time I'll try to, inshallah. Okay. Um, is this till 2.30? <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, inshallah. Tayyip, so, okay, we have the first pillar, which is faith and knowledge. Faith in terms of building the Iman, the motivating factor within the person. Um, and we talked about how to build that, the type of knowledge that you need in order to build that Iman. That builds faith, but we also need knowledge, and I'm, I'm, I'm using these terms a little loosely. Knowledge, more so the technical aspect. Halal and haram, do this, don't do that. Uh, so it's, it's not like either or, it's both and. But we need to put a heavy emphasis, especially on, in the beginning, on faith building, you know, teachings. And then as the motivation is increasing, we start learning more about the technical aspects of the religion because we want to do good. Now that we, now that we have Iman, we're motivated. How do, how do I not have my brains boil on the day of judgment or, you know, in, in hellfire? What do I need to do to, to escape being under the, the sun for 50,000 years? Well, here are the people who will be under the shade. Here are the people. Now, how do I become a person, an Imam al-Adil, for example, a just ruler? Well, you need to learn the technical knowledge of halal and haram and right and wrong in order to do that. So <clears throat> that's the first pillar. Amanu bi rabbihim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he gave the youth iman or they had iman and Allah increased them in guidance second pillar is here again we can use any term brotherhood, fraternity bonds right I use the word fraternity in this case Literally, now here, I just copied and pasted the translation. But here, rabatna means to tie, right? To, 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 to kind of tie a knot. Like you have a boat, for example, and you want to tie it to the dock. That's what evolved, right? Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tied their hearts together. So they were tied. Now, they say courage because what happens when you're, when, you're, when you're tethered to something, you're strong. You feel strong because you have, you have something that anchors you. You have something that's holding you down, so to speak. So you're, you're not going to float off anywhere. Right? So, rabatna ala qulubihim. I'll give you an example in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about the mother of Musa, alayhi salam. Mother Musa When Musa was born, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, throw him in the river. 
the, in, the, in the Nile River, a baby, put him in the river to save him from the Pharaoh because the Pharaoh was killing infant boys. He would slaughter them. So how do you save, how does a mother, how can a mother save her baby from this tyrant who's going around in each house? You know, you can't hide a baby. He's, he's going to cry. Right? Babies cry. Right, so what do you, how can you, how can you save this baby? Eventually he's going to be found. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, اقلفيه tabut, put him in a box. فقلفيه في and take that box and throw it into the river. So she throws the box into the river. As we know, it takes, it takes Musa alayhi salam down to the river bank and eventually he gets picked up by the Pharaoh's people himself. Point here is, imagine being the mother of that child. You already have the separation of just leaving your child anywhere, like anywhere, even if it was a safe place, right? Who, 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 what mother would feel, you know, happy about leaving their newborn infant son somewhere where they're not gonna see them anymore? That's one. Number two, it's not that she just left him anywhere. She put him in the river. So then there's, and the fact that she had to do that herself is one thing if someone else did that. She herself did that. She had to directly engage in doing that. That creates a lot of anxiety. That creates a lot of tension. Um, and then the third thing is, I don't know what happened. I saw him go off, and I have no idea what happened after that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes her, her state. He says, the fu'ad, the heart, and Allah describes heart as fu'ad and the qalb, and he also talks about sadr, the chest. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Asbaha fu'adu ummi Musa. The heart of the mother of Musa was empty. Right, because her child was everything, and so she just gave everything away. But you know, so her heart was empty. In she almost exposed what she had done. Right, you know, because usually when you when you have anxiety, when you're in, in, in extreme emotional distress. The one thing that helps, the one thing you want to do is talk to somebody. Like, so for example, let's say, let's say you were driving on the highway and someone, you know, cursed at you and said all these other things and now you're mad. You didn't do anything back to them, but you're, you're just, you're very disturbed that this happened to you. When you go home, what do you want to talk about? You just you see this person that happened, you know, you want empathy. You want someone to hear you. You want someone to, 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 to tell you something to help you deal with whatever you're dealing with, right? So imagine the mother of Musa, after what she had done, right? She almost revealed what she had done. In What's the thing that stopped her from doing that? Because imagine, if she had said that, what would have happened? If she had went to someone and said, listen, I can't bear this secret anymore. I, this is what I did to my child. I put him in the river and so on and so forth. What would have happened? What do you think would have happened? If she, well, she might have gotten admonished. That's one, but something else. Well, yeah, that maybe she would have been accused of killing her own child. That's another thing, but something else. I'm looking for something else, though. Right, because eventually, you know, because that's a bizarre story. Like a woman throwing her child in a river, that was spread. That news was spread. It was spread to someone who found a child in the river from the people of the Pharaoh, from the family of the Pharaoh, and what would the Pharaoh have done? He would have killed him. That was the whole point, was to kill him in the first place. That's what the Pharaoh wanted to do. He didn't know where this child came from. He didn't know who this child was, where he came from, right? Some miraculous situation. It's a, you know, a child in a, in a, in a box that's just floated to, to me, you know, you know, I don't know, maybe we can get some benefit. And that's what, that's what the mother of Musa, the mother of uh, the wife 
of, uh, of the Pharaoh said that maybe he can benefit us. When, when she saw this child, she told, she convinced the Pharaoh to adopt him. So the point here is that she was in such emotional distress that she almost told on herself, Lola, the only thing that stopped her from doing it, we tied her heart down. Right? The idea, same idea here. What about na ala how did like what did what did how did how were their hearts how was her heart tied down? Well, one interpretation, there's more than one interpretation. There's one interpretation is that Allah had already told her what was gonna happen before she put Musa alayhi salam in the river. So Allah speaking directly to her, right? And this might have been through a dream or an angel or whatever, you know, Allah alam. But Allah told her that the river will deliver him to my enemy and your enemy. And then Allah talks about you know, the rest of the story. Um, so she knew that something good was going to happen. She just didn't see it yet. So that kept her hopeful. That kept her looking forward to something. So long as you have, you have something to look forward to, you'll bear the stress of dealing with something because you think something's good going to come out of it. That's what keeps your heart tied down. This is why it's important to learn about Jannah, to learn about Hellfire, to learn about the rewards, things like that, because that gives you hope. Like, yes, this is very uncomfortable for me to do. I really don't like what this is doing to me. I don't feel good about it, but I feel better about the results that are going to come. So I'm willing to do this in order to get those results. That's what the boys of the cave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them that fortitude, tied them down. If qamu, and they stood together, so they had something to stand for. So this comes with companionship. So it wasn't just one individual who did this. They found each other, they stood up together, and they said, Rabbuna Rabbu samawati wal Our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Now, what did they need courage for in the first place? Uh, it's important to kind of know the backstory here. Isa alayhi salam, when he was raised up, you know, you know the, the, the Jews and the Romans, Th think of the Jews during that time as like current day state of Israel. They have their own country, they had their own king, the Jews had their own king, they had their own country, it was occupying Palestine at the time. I mean, it was their country at that time. And they were under the protection of the Romans. So yes, they had their own country, they had their own politics, they had their own leadership, but they, had, they were backed by the Romans. They couldn't do anything that the Romans didn't approve of, basically. And um, it's kind of the you know, relationship that the U.S. has with Israel right now. Right, right. This is this is when when you when you study history, you'll see patterns. You'll see a lot of patterns. Right. Um, anyway, well, we you know that's that's a whole another conversation. In any case, Isa um, alayhi salam came because as a result of being under a another superpower, the Romans were pagans. Most you know kids they go to school and they learn about all the different gods, well, you have the villa of the, of the Romans, you have Zeus, you have this, you have that. They make movies about it. Thor, all right? Thor is the thunder god, right? And so on and so on. These are all, you know, a lot of these movies are, 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 are entertainment forms of theology, of pagan, of pagan theology. All right? In any case, if that is your, if that's the superpower that is controlling the area, and you're a, a religious group which originates from Musa alayhi salam, that creates some tension, right? As leaders, like as the leaders of that country, you have to make certain compromises 
in order not to displease the people who are protecting you or the people who are controlling you. So they started, you know, they sold out their religion. They had sold it out a long time before that, but at this point it's, you know, sold out so far, you know, they've changed their religion so much that they need a prophet, they need a messenger to come and renew the religion for them. Isa alayhi salam came and renewed the religion. The leaders didn't like that. The Jewish leaders didn't like that. Uh, the king definitely didn't like that. So what did they do? They accused Isa alayhi salam of, of wanting to be the king. He's trying to create sedition. He's trying to overthrow the government. He's a terrorist. He's this, he's that. They started calling him all these things. I mean, they call him a terrorist, right? I'm just using new terminology for old ideas, right? They started calling him all of these political, politically charged names. Um, and they, and, but they, were, they still didn't want to just kill him outright because he had followers. He had Hawadiyin, he had the disciples. He was doing all these miracles. People were converting to, 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 to the religion. So they had the Romans do it, right? If you, don't over, if you don't do something about this person, this person's a problem. If you don't do anything about this, it's going to be a problem for you, Romans. So they attempt to crucify him. And we know, They didn't kill him. They didn't crucify him. But it was made to look like that. Isa alayhi salam was risen up. And after that, Okay, Isa alayhi salam is gone. But you still have uh, uh, When Isa alayhi salam sensed that disbelief, that the disbelievers were maneuvering, he asked, he asked the people, who are going to be my Ansar? Who are going to support me and my message? The Hawariyun said, we're going to support your message. In other words, what this means is, Who's going to carry this on when I leave? Because I'm here. As so long as he's here, he's going to do what he needs to do. When he's gone, who's going to carry it on? The Hawari'in are. And those who follow them, and those who follow them, like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba, and then after the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, the Tabi'ir Tabi'een. Point is, after Isa Alayhi Salam left, the Romans, who do they start going after? The Hawari'in. They start going after the disciples. They go after anyone who believes in the message of Isa alayhi salam. They're trying to wipe it all the way out. This group of young men, not the picture, right? But this, the original group of young men, uh, before they go to the cave, they're living during this time period. They're living during a time period where if you said, Rabbuna Rabbu Samawat wal Ard, not uh, all the idols and all the, and, and Thor and Zeus and this, that, and the other, you, you would be killed. And they were young. And according to like the biblical tradition, they were actually soldiers. They were like young soldiers in, in, the, in, the, in the army. Um, <clears throat> but they came together, they found each other, they believed in one, they, you know, they supported each other, and they said, we're going to stand up and we're going to. Uh, is in fact, some say that this time period was the first time, so this particular Roman king had come into power. And Christianity, when we say Christianity, we're just talking about early followers of Isa alayhi salam. These were the actual Muslims at the time. So don't get caught up in the terms. We say Christian, we just mean those who followed Isa. They were actually Muslim at the time, right? So those people were a problem because no matter how much they killed them, they persecuted them, they tortured them, they would still spread the religion. I mean, they were doing things like taking those Muslims and putting them in uh, the Colosseums. You know, gladiators, you heard of gladiators. So they'll take them in the Colosseums and then they would take starving lions and hyenas and you know, it would be like a, 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 a public, it was entertainment. And they would just watch the believers be eaten to death, right? They would take gladiators and the gladiators would fight them and kill them and all these. It was like a whole spectacle. They were trying to do as much as they can to put fear in those who believed so they would renounce their religion. But this particular king went a step further. 
He said, I'm going to make a ceremony where every, every citizen must go to the altar and make a sacrifice, sacrifice an animal in the name of the gods for national security reasons. I'm using modern terms. But he said, well, I, well, the reason why I say national security, because he made it seem like the problems that we're going through as, uh, as, as a empire are due to our lack of faith. So in order to renew that faith, so the, so the gods will protect us and sustain us, we have to all make a sacrifice. And anyone who doesn't make a sacrifice is threatening our national security because this is all the reasons why we have these problems, right? So that was like a litmus test. We call that like a litmus test to see which, if you really believe. Not only did they have to slaughter the animal in the name of the gods at the altar, but then they had to eat the, the food, like they had to cook the meat and eat it, right? Which would also have been haram. Now you can't slaughter in the name of some idol, even if you slaughtered in the right way, slaughter in the name of some idol and then eat the you know, chicken or lamb or what have you that, you that you sacrificed, right? So before you could have just been believer and just stayed at home and you know, worshiped, but now to sacrifice publicly in the name of some God and then eat the food from there, you can't do that. There's no compromise there. There's nothing you can do to hide your faith at that point. So these group, this group of young men, they said, you know, they, we have no choice. We have to, <laughs> we have to say the truth. Our Lord is the, heaven, is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. And we're not going to let neta'u'am in dunihi ilaha. We're not going to call upon any other Lord except him. All right. So, th so th this story actually makes sense in light of that context. Wallahu alam, you know, if that's actually the situation that they set it in. But according to what we know about this, or, you know, the information that we have is probably during that time. Right? Probably during that time. But wallahu alam. We shall never appeal to any other deity except him. If we do, we shall be saying something improper or wrong. It's wrong to, to, to invoke anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, What does that have to do with today? Aren't there things that our people are being called to accept today that's directly contradictory to Islam? Right? To accept as good, right? To identify according to these things, right? So, and they come after the youth for these things. They, they incorporate that in the educational system, right? And at, some, at a certain point, you have to stand and say, no, this is improper. This is what I stand for. This is what Allah teaches me. This is what my prophet teaches me. And it's improper. But it's hard to do that while, when you're by yourself. So it's important to create that fraternity, companionship, because that builds courage, right? You can have Iman, but by yourself, the Surah Yusuf, uh, surah uh, 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 Yasin. Allah sends a messenger. He sends two messengers. And he sends a third messenger to them. We are all messengers to you. Right? To strengthen the message. If it was one, if it's two, it's still not a group. But once it's three, now we're a group. So three messengers sent to them at the same time. And then even then they didn't believe. And so another man, Jamin Aqsa al Medina, a man from the end of the city came, but he came by himself and he was killed. He wound up being killed. In any case, but that shows the level of courage he had. Right? That's why Allah mentions him in his Qalb al Quran, it's the heart of the Quran. The level of courage, he had so much heart that he was, his, his story is mentioned in the heart of the Qur'an, right? In any case, knowledge and faith was the first pillar. The second pillar is creating that fraternity of brotherhood. Bring, you need to put, you need to connect, our young people need to connect with each other, or if you have your kids or you know, youth in the, in the community, connect them with people who have that same attitude. Those who don't, 
they need, they're still on the first pillar. You need to work on them on that first pillar. But those who have the first pillar, they need to be working together, strengthening each other, giving each other courage. You know, so like, for example, if you're in a, if you're in a school, if, let's say some kids go to public school, you know, it is what it is, right? A lot of Muslims wind up going to public school. <clears throat> At the very least, what you can do is put them in a public school with other Muslims, like more Muslims that are in that public school, the better. Not just Muslims, but the more Muslims that come from families that are inculcating that first pillar, right? The easier it is for them to practice their deen. When I was young, when I, I'm talking about back in the 80s and 90s, right? <clears throat> I used to pray like Dhuhr and Asr and, and, at school by myself. There was like no other Muslims there right? in, in the teacher's lounge. And uh, one, of the, one of the teachers uh, said, you know, we had a, we had a uh, I think it was reading class. This is like third grade. I still remember this like it was yesterday. It's like third grade. One of the kids said, oh, the tooth fairy came and um, gave me five dollars, whatever. Y'all familiar with the tooth fairy, right? You know, you lose a tooth, put it under the pillow, and the next morning you find money under it, right? You know, like, yeah, so a tooth fairy came and gave me some money. So, you know, it's a common lie that you know, is told to children. In any case, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not thinking, I'm just thinking, I'm a child, right? So I'm not thinking, I'm thinking like, why would you tell, like, why would a parent tell their child that they didn't give them money? <laughs> right? To me, it was just, it didn't make any sense to me. So I said, and I knew that, you know, it was well known that the tooth fairy isn't real, but this child actually believed this. So I said, I was, I said, you know, well, and, and so she, anyway, she tell, tells the story and the, the teacher says, oh, well, you know, the tooth fairy really loves you, et cetera, et cetera. And all the kids kind of like clapped for it. I didn't, I didn't really clap. I wasn't like being mean or anything. I just, I just didn't understand why they were clapping about this. So the teacher says, there's something wrong. I said, no, I said, you know, <laughs> it, you do know your parents gave you that money. The tooth fairy isn't real. Right? You should be thanking your parents for that, you know. Um, and the teacher said, well, when you go in the teacher's lounge and pray, we don't all believe that your God is real. Right? So you should. So she's comparing God to the tooth fairy. Well, yeah, the Right? Right? I, I was just, I was so confused <laughs> that an adult would say something so dumb. In any case, uh, you know, obviously my parents came and, you know, handled that situation. But the point is, I was by myself in that room. Like, no one else seemed to speak up. Like, it seemed like all the other kids were okay with this. You know, like no one else like believed it. But it's easier if you were in an environment where other people also believe what you believe. I mean, it's a basic concept, right? Beyond that, beyond just school and things like that, also give them something to stand for, right? Because Allah said, فَقَامُوا, they stood up for something. Give them things to stand for, right? Um, adopting projects in the neighborhood, like a f shelter, a food pantry, a community garden. Give them something to, to do together. Right? And in the name of doing something for you to be Right? Give them a service, a project to do where they can work together and they can get some, some sense of you know, pride in the good sense. Right? Izza. Right? Not, not kibber, but Izza. Like, you know, a sense of you know, pride for the religion. That's the second. Third pillar. وَإِذِ اَعْتَزَلْتُمُوهُمْ وَمَا يَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ فَأْوُوا إِلَى الْكَهْفِ So the third thing is that now that you've withdrawn from them, so first you have faith and knowledge. Second, you have your fraternity of brothers and sisters who, who stand for the same thing you stand for. So what's the next thing to do? You need to create spaces where you're spiritually safe, right? Not safe space, just emotionally, what happens, spiritually, where, you, where your values, the things that you, like there's certain things that, are, that don't, aren't really up for debate, because we all agree already on those things, right? Those, those we create spaces where those things are, are safe from being criticized, right? So, what did Allah tell them to do? 
withdraw from the people, to worship Allah, and take refuge in that cave. What happens when they take refuge in the cave? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yanshur lakum rabbukum, that Allah will spread his grace over you. Mirrahmatihi, from his mercy. Wayuhayyitlakum, and he will endow you whatever your outward condition. Min amrikum, mirfaqa or marfiqa, depending on the qira'ah. Right? He will give you what you need. He'll give you what you need. There's, in other words, in other words, to make this more like basic to understand, when we make the intention and we go through the process of trying to create these spaces for young people who have the faith and the knowledge and the camaraderie, then Allah gives you tawfiq. Don't worry about the odds. Don't worry about you know, all these obstacles. Oh, we have to have this, we have to have that. I mean, yeah, we, we have to deal with that. But Allah is going to give you tawfiq. Allah is going to, he's going to make the path merciful for you and he's going to give you what you need in order to fulfill that in ways that you won't expect. So don't be tied to a particular way of doing things. Be open to any way that Allah opens things for you. And that's what they were willing to do. Why did they have to leave? Because the king was going to kill them. They were going to be persecuted. And so they had asked, they had asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beforehand, Rabbana atina min ladunka rahmah. They asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah, bring us mercy. Wahayyit lana min amrina rashana. And give us a way, like to deal with this situation so we can be guided in the right way. We don't know what to do. Right? How are we going to deal with this scenario? We're told, you know, to celebrate this holiday. Right? It's actually a holiday coming up right now. It's very similar to that holiday. Uh, in any case, we're told to celebrate this holiday, to slaughter these animals, to eat this haram food. And we're just young people. We don't have support system. Our families aren't behind us. You know, we only have you. What, we don't know what to do. Prepare something for us. Right? So what, and Allah answered it. He said, Go to this cave, I will give you, I will be, I will give you grace, I will give you mercy. And I will prepare a space with everything that you need. Now, what does that have to do with contemporary and contemporary sense? Sometimes you need to physically go somewhere. Even just for a temporary time period. The Prophet ﷺ used to do this prior to, to reaching um, you know, prophethood. Retreats. Connect them to nature. Not just that. Travel to other communities to broaden their perspective on the Muslim community and benefit from the wisdom of others. There are other people who are already doing this. Right? It, that doesn't mean you have to move there. I mean, that, that might be one, one solution. But at least going to visit exposing them to other youth who are doing similar and maybe even more farther along in their journey to inspire them, to give them a sense of vision, something to look up to, something to look forward to becoming. Right? So physically, so taking, putting yourself in physical spaces where you're spiritually secure. That's the third pillar. Fourth pillar, and we're starting to come to a close at least on this part. Uh, fourth pillar, financial literacy. I know it sounds kind of strange because <laughs> we're talking about faith and, and knowledge and then fraternity, like brotherhood, and then, you know, spiritual safe spaces. Those all are familiar to us, but then financial literacy, what does that have to do with anything? Well, first of all, Allah talks about this. We, we kind of read this in Surah Kahf and we just gloss over it. But when you think about it, it's actually very interesting. So this is when they woke up. So obviously we know the story. They, they, they come to uh, the cave. They lay their head, head down to rest. They don't know what's about to happen to them, by the way. They just take a nap and they wake up. Like we're, we're taking it from their perspective right now. You, you went, you took your, imagine you went out camping. Like, oh, let's just get away from the world. You know, you know we'll figure it out once we get out there, but let's just get away. You go away, you all go in under your tent, you go in your tent. You take a nap, you go to sleep that night, and you just wake up. 
All right, so he woke up. So Allah says, when, and so we awaken them so that they might question. So they started talking to each other when they woke up. Because obviously they're looking around and they even might even feel a little different and they're looking around and clearly things probably have changed even within the cave. You know, sp even just a spider web, like, you know, you, 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 there's no activity happening in the cave all that time. So it could have been all kinds of things that have changed in the cave in terms of spider webs and, you know, a nest over here and so on and so And there were openings, right? The, the sun was coming in, the sunlight was coming in from different angles. So that creates whole, you know, environments and habitats and things like that. So they woke up and they probably looked around and, you know, it just felt different. All right, so... How long will we sleep? <laughs> so they basically agreed, like, we slept quite, you know, quite a bit, like either a whole day, right? We slept a little too long, probably, or, you know, some of the day. Even after that, they still weren't fully convinced. So it's it, it, so like, Allahu Alam, like this ain't, this doesn't seem normal. Like the, you know, well, whatever we did when we fell asleep, there's something different. They, they, there were plenty of signs. I guess there was enough signs around on their clothes. You know, imagine, imagine just your clothes. 300 years, just laying on the ground and, you know, moving around a little bit. That would have worn down their clothes too. I mean, we're speculating here, but it's, you know, it's, it's not far-fetched, right? Their clothes, the, you know, even, even the markings on the ground, the impression that they might have made on the ground for 300 years, right? The weight of that, there might be small impressions on the ground. Like, Allah alam, like, it's far-fetched that we'd have been asleep for hundreds of years or anything, but it still doesn't add up that we slept for a shorter period of time. So... So, how do we figure this out? Let's send one of, let's send one of us down to the town. Because it might have been a week. Because remember why they were there in the first place. They were there not to be persecuted. So maybe, yeah, we might have overslept a couple days or what have you. Or we might have just forgot how long we've been here. But maybe the danger, you know, maybe they're not looking for us anymore, right? Maybe they've kind of passed. So go down and check, you know, in the city. Now, here's the point. So send one of you down with these silver coins to the city with this money. They haven't, like, I think, you know, we pass over this, but it's a very interesting point. Allah, Allah didn't have to mention this. There's a whole lot of things, like for example, the changes that happened in the cave, he doesn't mention any of those things. But it was clear that there was something that had happened that made them feel like they, had, they didn't know how long they were there. But he doesn't mention that. But he makes a point to mention that they have money. So one, they have money. And they're young. Which means a number of things. Number one, they had some type of skill that got them that money, most likely. Number two, they had the discipline to save that money. <laughs> right? These are, we're talking about young people. Remember, I don't know if all of you were here before the but we said like desire and the test of the dunya and to kind of show a sense of discipline and which one of you are going to act in the best way. Right, so this all comes, this all is manifested in these youth where they didn't spend their money frivolously. They actually brought money with them to help them on their path. Right, so they saved the money. So they learned the skill, they learned how to budget. Not only that, but they learned how to spend it. Why? Because Allah says, فَلْيَنْظُرْ أَيُّهَا أَزْكَى طَعَامًا Find the purest food. Not just good food, the purest one. 
In order to know the purest food, you have to understand how, how, how things work in the marketplace. <laughs> you, have to know, you have to know how to find those things. You have to know how to identify those things. In other words, you got to know how to spend money right. Now, uh, also, it also indicates if we're taking the, the historical narrative into account that meat wasn't halal, right? That all, not all the food was halal there either. So they had to, remember, because they had to slaughter and then they had to eat the meat. From, so now all the meats out there were halal and, 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 and even the items that they were buying, even the non-meat items probably, you know, just go to the store with the, you know, person who has the best. He said ezka from, from the word, same word of zakah, right? Pure is pure. Uh, tezkia comes from that word, purifying the soul. So they were looking at food as a source of spiritual purification. Ezkal ta'amit. They didn't say altiyab. They didn't say halal. They said ezkal. Because so usually we say halal and tayyiba. You know, but they're looking at it in an high, even higher level. Ezkal in terms of what is spiritually good for us. Not just the nature of the food. So the nature can be halal. It needs to be. Then it needs to also, it should be good. You know, in terms of how it was. So, but then my relationship with that food, is that going to increase me spiritually or decrease me? It could be good. It could be halal. But it's not the best thing for me spiritually. Right? As kal ta'am. Find that. So they knew how to spend, spend their wealth. Take that into consideration today. There's a green light study in 2021 that found, found that nearly three quarters of teens, 74%, reported they don't feel confident in their personal finance knowledge. This is, you know, 2021. About the same percentage of teens, 73%, said they wanted to learn more. So it's not due to a lack of interest. It's just due to a lack of opportunity. All right, we're not, and that's why I say the idea of financial literacy, we're not really thinking about that part as much. We're thinking about salah, zakah, you know, maybe even going out on retreats, they could, what have you, whatever it is, and that's, that's great. But they also are very interested in this as well, and it's very important for them. Because what, they're at the age where they start using money. And money is directly related to your spiritual state. Sadaqah. So you take Surah Layl, for example. What does Allah say? فَأَمَّا مَنْ أَعْطَى وَالتَّقَى Whoever gives has taqwa. Right? Because that's a direct correlation with your taqwa. You can't say I have a whole bunch of taqwa and you're bakhil. Like it, it doesn't. Well, a was taqna, and a person who's miserly, and you know, it's like I'm, I'm my own person. I don't need you. You don't need me. You know, I, you know, I pick myself up by my bootstraps. All these other things. So, you're, the way you spend is a very strong indicator of your spiritual state. It's not everything. But it's a heavy, heavy indicator. Allah said, So it makes it easy for you to do sin. The way you spend money and the, and the way more you give makes it easier for you to do the other things of righteousness. Right? So financial literacy is extremely important. Anyway, this class, because I sent it in a PowerPoint form, not pages, this was actually a video, right? So this video I uh, was showing in Merrill Lodge Academy, where this is a financial literacy class, and that's my mother there. Uh, she's teaching the students. Um, she's, she's saying you want to spend according to your values. So she asked them about common stores that they, you know, you would commonly buy things from, um, Costco, uh, you, know, you know, whatever the stores are. And then she asked them, what values do they have that align with your values? Right? Just, you know, what do you think about how, you know, about their values? One of them said, oh, like, for example, Costco provides a halal lamb or something like that. And so she was like, okay, you know. So, so, so they're taking into account halal foods so on and so forth. Or some of them said, oh, they, you know, they, they, they uh, give access to bulk product, you know, pro products in bulk for bigger families, uh, making it easier for people 
to sustain their families, that type of thing. You know, other people mention a halal restaurant, you know, who give, that, who, and they actually mentioned, <laughs> the, one of the students mentioned, you know, they donate food to the masjid and, and, and to the school. So we want to make sure we go to those restaurants and, and, you know, make a point of going there as opposed to another place. Right, because they support the masjid, they support these other initiatives. So just getting them thinking about that, right? And, and coming to those conclusions. Uh, and, you know, so it, and it goes to other places where they spend money and where, even where you bank, right? Uh, it might not be perfect. That's why they said, Ezka ta'am, the purest. Like, okay, what's available? We can't control everything that's available. But let's get the best of what's available. That's all you can do. If I took Allah, I still talk to him. Have talk of Allah according to how much you can. Right? And last pillar, the fifth pillar, don't seek popularity, especially as young people. Right? The last part, waliyatalattaf. Actually, that is half. Waypoint of the Quran. All right, from the word latif, to be gentle, to be kind, to be cautious as well. Right? Just don't don't you know don't stir the pot too much, don't don't disturb things too much. Right? Let them be, and here is courteous. Um ahada. And don't let anyone know who you are. Like just be, you know, be, uh, what do you call it, in, uh, I can't remember, I can't think of the word, uh, not incognito, but um, inconspicuous, inconspicuous. You know, you, you know, you're just a regular person. You come, you go, no one, you're not, no one's thinking, you don't stand out from among the people, right? The Prophet wasallam said in Hadith al-Tirmidhi, he said, indeed, for everything, there is a hype. Shirra, he describes it, shirra, as a hype. It's like, it's like a bad negative hype, right? Um, everything has a hype, you know, has one end that is a hype, and for every hype, there's a slackening. Fetara, right? It has, it, it, it slackens, it has like an ebb and flow, right? And you, the easiest way to think about that today is social media, right? All of a sudden, this person blows up. And it's, you know, they're everywhere and everyone's talking about them. It's trending. They get millions of likes. And then all of a sudden, some scandal happens and it goes the opposite direction. All right? We know this. We know, you know, things that are going on right now. <laughs> right? Um, everything has, things that have a hype like that where they just shoot up and then all of a sudden it goes down as a slackening. So if an amil here is translated as practitioner, but a person who's doing something behaves with discipline and moderation, then you can have hopes for him. Like in other words, you don't get caught up in the hype. Be straight and narrow, operate with moderation, operate with discipline, principled. It's not necessarily popular, but it builds and it grows over time. And in fact, the Sahaba were described like this. In, uh, in Surah, uh, is it Muhammad or Surah Fatah? Um, right, and so it starts off small. It's like, you know, the Sahaba were starting off, they were a small number, and then they, they grew, and then, you know, the stalk became strong, and then the roots took. And then Yurjibul Kufara li Yurjibul Zura, right? So then all of a sudden, over time, you notice, man, this is a really, you know, if you ever do gardening, you know, it looks like this. Looks like, I don't know if this is going to survive <laughs> the way it's looking right now. And I'm going to keep watering it, though, and eventually it becomes strong and it's bearing a lot of fruit. That is how things with Baraka tend to, to operate. It starts off slow. No one knows, you know, how, if it's going to turn out well, but it starts with a good knee, a good intention and it allows it to grow naturally, as opposed to shooting up, you know, and you know, you know, oak trees versus pine trees. Pine trees are, are notoriously weak, right? An oak tree is very strong, but it grows very slowly in comparison to pine trees. That's why everything is made out of pine wood now, 
because of you know the economy they just you know are trying to produce wood uh, in any case but if you can have hope for that person if they are operating with discipline moderation you know with lutuf right not going not getting ahead of themselves but if the fingers are pointed to him then don't count him among the worthy fingers like everybody knows you everybody's pointing at you right negatively or positively negatively is usually not good either right um, where you want everybody to know you want everybody to know who you are walking in a room there's so and so right everybody's pointing at you don't look for that that's not a good sign especially not in the beginning if that happens down the road you know like I said that in the end it, it doesn't start with hype it starts moderate and then it builds and you know if Allah gives it that that test because it's a it's a it's a ibtila to have that much attention on you then it gives you that test but if it starts off like that and people are pointing off pointing fingers don't count them among the worthy Anas bin Malik in another narration says it is sufficient evil for a man like in other words it's enough of a, of a tribulation right? that uh, for fingers to be raised at him for everyone to be pointing at you and paying attention to you regarding religion or worldly matters whether it's in deen or dunya right um, except for one whom Allah has protected right and, and that's why I say it's not all bad you know it's a test right so some Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected them from being um, to, from falling into the pitfalls of that of that tribulation uh, they, they, they still have the tribulation but they're not negatively affected by it they stay you know yet, 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 they're still mutalatif right? they're still operating with lutuf um, why? because in the next ayah innahum iyabharu alaykum if you become popular yarjumukum oh you're idukum fi millatihim one or two things are going to happen this is important for youth to know as well one or two things are going to happen either they will stone you or they will turn you back to your religion remember the reason why they were in the cave in the first place it, because once you're known let's say you become popular on social media once you're known you have a decision to make you have to either reject the trends that you're being pressured to do like okay everybody's saying this well what do you think about it like everybody knows you what do you think about this so now you have to make a decision disagree with what everybody's what everybody wants you to do in which case they stone you or you, you fold under pressure and go with what everyone wants you to do and you'll lose your religion so you lose your life or you lose your religion one or the two this is why being popular is dangerous for one spirit success real success long-term everlasting success is attained by being balanced humble and not taking fame or popularity in, 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 in one basic sense you can look at this pillar as adab have adab don't lose your adab adab keeps you moderate <laughs> keeps you disciplined all right um, <clears throat> So, to summarize, we have the five pillars of righteous youth. One, building faith and knowledge. Number two, building that fraternity, brotherhood, sisterhood. Right? Three, creating spiritually safe spaces for them to cultivate uh, that brotherhood and sisterhood in Iman. Four, financial literacy in a way that understanding that money is a spiritual thing has a spiritual effect on you and it's not that you run away from money but you learn how to utilize it right as we mentioned and last civility adept having adept don't seek popularity don't go i don't uh, lose yourself right focus on um being civil and having adept inshallah Okay, well, it's not enough time. I know we've gone way over, way, it was almost three o'clock. I know we've gone way over time. Um, so I was just going to mention in brief that uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, you know, we, we, we built uh, our school, Miraj, on these kind of principles. And this picture here,
This is proof I haven't gained that much weight, right? This is the same jacket I'm wearing now. <laughs> same jacket I'm wearing now. Uh, this is in New Haven, Connecticut. This is in, in Masjid al-Islam, where Imam Zaid started. Uh, he didn't start Masjid al-Islam, but he was one of the early uh, Imams of Masjid al-Islam. Um, and um, I had returned from, uh, I think, Morocco. I was in Syria at this point. Um, but I was part of a group, and this was also one of my classmates from before. We learned Quran in, the, in that spot. We used to sit there and study Quran. I memorized 24 jizzit before going to Morocco and continuing my hif there or finishing my hif there. Um, but those are the kind of principles that I, you know, that I noticed when I was growing up in New Haven, Connecticut. And, um, and many of those things I carried with me into when I went to Memphis, when I grew up and went to Memphis, Tennessee, and actually in New Haven, the New Haven Register, the, New, the, the newspaper actually covered this um, memorizing Quran, a spiritual quest for young men. <laughs> that was, uh, I don't have the date there, but that was, I think it was around 9-11, or right after 9-11. Oh, right before, it might have been before, Low Island. But, um, but this was the type of cave we were in, <laughs> right? And uh, alhamdulillah, uh, not only do we just create that, but we want to recreate that. We want to create, you know, the, 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 the secret of those people of the cave, they came out 300 years later, right? What had happened 300 years later? 300 years later, the Roman Empire was Christian. So when they go down there, they see crosses everywhere, you know, and why was it important for them to appear at that Why Why wasn't it 700 years? Maybe 1,000, it could have been 1,000 years. Why 300? Because that particular time period, the Christian, so that now it's a state religion, right? It's a state religion, and the state is trying to Redefine Christianity is, is, is the classic case if you, if you can't beat them, join them, right? Over time, with all the persecution, it didn't work. So they said, we'll just become Christian. So that, imagine if Donald Trump becomes Muslim for the wrong reasons, right? If you can't Muslim, a great, mashallah, tabarak Allah, be a great, that'd be a great thing, even though everyone wouldn't necessarily like that. <laughs> but imagine if you became Muslim for the wrong reasons, right? And then said, and then started trying to, you know, enlist scholars to come. They're going to have a council where all the scholars will have ijma of, of, of consensus on whether or not, uh, you know, pork is halal, for example. Let's let's rethink this. Let's rethink this issue. I just want to make sure. Let's get all the scholars. The scholars I want there. This is what they were doing. The Council of Nicaea, this is what they were doing at that time. So what were they debating? They were debating the nature of Isa alayhi salam. Who is Isa alayhi salam? Is he divine or not? Does he have God-like qualities or is he human? Did he, did he die and is he going to be resurrected or not? These are the questions they were asking at that exact time. So when these young men come out, two things. Number one, they're original Christians. They're early Christians. They were there right after Isa so they're, so, so they're able to say, wait a second. Not just this, but a whole lot of other things that y'all are doing are, <laughs> are not what Isa alayhi salam taught, right? Because we lived during that period. How do, we, how, how do we know you lived during that period? Well, first of all, look at, look at the money that we have. What's that? The coin, right? Look at these coins, right? Where, where do we get these from? Right, the, the coins only came like what Christian would be carrying around coins of a of an emperor that was killing the Christian? Like you know, it doesn't make any sense, right? The clothes they were wearing probably 300 years, you know, outdated, right? Um, and some say that they were known. This was a big scandal during the time when they left because remember they were supposed to be killed, but they disappeared. Some say they went into this cave and they say what well, Rakimi was they, they had inscribed the names of these young men. There's a difference of opinion on what Raqim means, but it's mentioned in, in the Quran. Am hasibtum anna ashab al-kahfi wa raqim was raqim. Maybe it's the place. Maybe they had, their names had been inscribed on the wall 
of the cave because they know they had gone in there somewhere, but they couldn't find them. Right? Um, but they were like a legend at that point, like the young men who disappeared. You know, we have, we have legends of people who disappeared, and we don't know what happened to them. The plane that disappeared, for example. These are things that have happened. Imagine, imagine like the same kind of scenario. A plane disappears, we don't know, there's no wreckage in the water, and all of a sudden these people appear. You know, years later, hundreds of years later, and they say, well, yeah, we were there, and they have proof. They're like, you know, here's the ticket. When I, when I got on the, uh, on the plane, here's the clothes, here's the passport. I got all the, everything about me is from that time period, which is too far back for me to just collect all these things individually, right? Especially as a, a, a seven, eight young men all collaborating and getting all this money and clothes, and, you know, that, that's far-fetched. All right, so number one, they have proven that they were from that place, from that, from that time period. So they can say, this is, no, this was really what Christianity was about. Number two, which is even more important. So number one, they had credibility. But number two, Isa alayhi salam did not die. And he was not resurrected. He's not resurrected because he didn't die. Resurrection has to happen after death. He wasn't resurrected, so he didn't die. Well, what happened? Well, you know, tawaffa doesn't necessarily mean die. Allahu ya tawaffa al-anfusa hina mawtiha wa lati lam tamut fi manamiha. So Allah uses the word tawaffa uh, to mean death and sleep. So it means death and sleep. He says, I, I put people, basically let's say put people down, for example, uh, in death and in sleep. The only difference between death and sleep is that in death, he doesn't release the soul back to you, but in sleep, the soul comes back to you. So it's a, it's a minor form of death. So then in the Quran, Allah also says, when Isa alayhi salam says what? فَلَمَّا تَوَفَّيْتَنِي كُنْتَ أَنْتَ الرَّقِيبَ عَلَيْهِمْ When you took me, but he uses tawaffa. He doesn't say, uh, 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 Right? He doesn't say you put me to death or you took my soul. Like in the death sense, he specifically uses tawaffa. And then you are watching over them at that point. So I know because in Surah Ma'idah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks Isa alayhi salam, did you tell them to worship you and, and your mother instead of me during your lifetime? And so Isa alayhi salam says, no. I told them what you, and only what you told me to tell them. And then when you took me, right, during that time, <laughs> when you took me, you were the one watching over them. You know what they, what they said and did. But one of the things Allah did was he sent these kids, he sent these young men into the cave to, uh, for this time period where they were going to debate this question again. Was he resurrected? The, the, these young men came out and they said, no, not only was he not resurrected, but he didn't die. Instead, he was taken like sleep. And the proof of that that's possible is standing right in front of you. Right? Um, this is why Umar who was not all the way inaccurate in terms of, like, it's not far-fetched for what Umar who assumed about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, his, his immediate assumption was that, no, he, he went to sleep and he will return, he will come back later. He, cause, because there was, there was uh, Isra Mi'raj, you know, he just disappeared and came back. Um, a Musa Alaihi Salam left, he came back. And, and, you know, maybe this is just his form of doing it. Right? He, he was doing, you know, he... He interprets things, right? and most of the time it was accurate, this time it wasn't. But it wasn't far-fetched. Why? Because of these understandings. They learned these understandings from Qur'an. It wasn't, he wasn't coming out of nowhere, right? <clears throat> and it, it wasn't until Abu Bakr, someone more knowledgeable than him, said, no, no, this is actually, and he reminded him of the other ayah, right? وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَلْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِ الرَّسُولِ أَفَيْمَاتَ Not to wafa, أَفَيْمَاتَ أُقْوَتِتْ if he dies or if he's killed, you're going to turn, like, no, this is, uh, this is this situation. This isn't that situation. This isn't 
uh, you know, the mountain of Sinai where he's, you know, getting revelation, or if this isn't Isra Mi'raj, which are all mentioned in the Quran as well, this is this, right? So the point, brothers and sisters, and I know we have people online as well, is we want to reproduce this for generations. It's not only about solving the problems of now. We need to create institutions that have perpetual, perpetual sustainability to where, they're re, that where the financial, we talk about financial literacy, they're financially stable enough to reproduce the same results over time because when new issues come up, these young people are going to be the ones who are going to have to answer these questions, right? Um, and alhamdulillah, you know, that masjid started, that masjid is still going, but then from there we've started other masjid in other places like Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and, you know, there's, there was a whole, you know, uh, breakdown that I was going to show how the, uh, how the students that we have now were take, taking those same principles. You saw, even though it wasn't the video, but the, the classes on, you know, financial literacy, giving khutbahs, character development, um, faith and knowledge, creating the safe spaces for them. And alhamdulillah, we've seen incredible results from, from these students. So, you know, faith and knowledge. They come before Fajr every day to, you know, get these actually, all these students are from the Bay. This is my original cohort from back in 2017. They're all from the Bay Area from Lighthouse. Um, these are Kims. I don't know if you know uh, Mike Kim and them, but they, uh, some, they, these are also from the Bay. Um, uh, this premier is in the masjid. You know, this is teaching them Arabic in the dorm. Um, we have professors, you know, just like anywhere else, when, when, when professors or speakers are in town, we bring them in, they talk to the students and give them some guidance. Imam Zaid is sitting there. If you notice him next to Brother Mustafa, he's sitting on the left. Um, you know, a range of Islamic topics, you know, Islamic studies. Obviously, we have all the traditional studies that they do, Tajweed, Sira, Fiqh, Akhida, um, Arabic. You know, when it comes to civility, right? This is a health fair that they helped organize in Memphis. Um, these are all, and I just chose the particular cohort that was from the Bay. Um, this is uh, the first aid, yeah, the first aid training, right? To learn how to, to, to be, and actually, Ahmed <laughs> was at the airport, I think it was the airport, and uh, someone started choking and he saved the person's life. He, he called me and he said, man, if it wasn't for, <laughs> if it wasn't for this, this class, I just would have watched this person die. I'm doing that. Uh, food pantry, uh, they're engaged in, this isn't our food pantry, this is another food pantry from Wharfton community. They're involved in that. Uh, they're also involved in our own food pantry that we have at the masjid. Uh, this is the community garden. They helped build uh, street cleanup. So they were involved in you know, some monthly cleanup of the street. Um, so, you know, they get this idea of neighborliness. Most of the people recognize them because they see them doing these things, right? This idea of waliya talattaf, right? Um, they also do khutbah training and, and all these type of things. Um, uh, health fair neighborhood. We just, in the fraternity, um, <clears throat> there's not one race of students, not mono, you know, not a monoculture. So uh, of all of the different students, just in this cohort alone, we, we have West African, um, Vietnamese, um, European American, Lebanese, African American, Puerto Rican, Korean, Mexican, South African. You know, there, a lot of these kids were mixed with all these different things. Um, spiritually safe environment. We also take them outside of Memphis, right? So we take, we take them on retreats. Uh, we take them to Morocco. This is us going to Morocco on, you know, on the plane and we take them to Fez uh, to see the history of Islam and, 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 and a th when, what, 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 what did it look like when Islam was thriving, right? And so we take them to places where it was thriving um, and, you know, give them a sense of uh, purpose. Alhamdulillah. I think that, okay, yeah, that was it. Um, and, and so alhamdulillah, so we're at the stage now where we're, we're you know, developing an endowment and long-term sustainability uh, for these students as well as a day program as opposed to just um, a, uh, a dorm program, which is this, 
this program is a, particularly is residential, but is based on these principles. And inshallah, you know, the community also, you know, hopefully be inspired by these things and start developing similar programs here. And hopefully these students, some of these students who are from the Bay are in uh, Egypt right now, uh, going to study at Azhar, inshallah. And hopefully when they return, they'll be able to, to make their contributions, because that's the idea. We want to send them back to their, their communities, not just, you know, for, for our own local purposes, but send them to their communities so that they can inspire future generations to come. So Jazakallah Khair, I know this was very, very long-winded. You said three, so, <laughs> so I took that very literally. And you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to give us all tawfiq, give you all tawfiq, give you youth tawfiq, make your youth among the shining leaders of the future and make them among the, the awliya and the salihin. And, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give, give you all tawfiq in this life and in, in, in the next life and reunite us all, whether you're here in person or uh, online in Jannah al Firdaus al A'la. Ameen. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.